Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Beyond Belief. My name is Adam Jacobs. Beyond Belief is a show that promotes free and open conversations with fascinating people striving together for meaning and integrity. And my guest tonight is no exception and is one of the very few people in the world, I would say, who has credibly challenged a prevailing scientific paradigm, which is the neo-Darwinian model of evolution. Michael Behe graduated from Drexel University in 1974 with a bachelor's of science in chemistry. He went on to get his PhD in biochemistry at the University of Pennsylvania and is now a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University and a founding senior fellow at Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. Please welcome to the Beyond Belief show, Professor Michael Behe. Thanks, Rabbi Jacobs. It's great to be with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to this conversation, as I mentioned to you, for quite some time. Mm. And um, I, you know, I uh, take my family usually once a year down to Hershey Park huh? and <laughs> drive past Lehigh University. And I tell you honestly that I have thought to myself many times, I should go in there and see if Professor Behe has office hours and uh, get a chance <laughs> to talk. And so uh, it's really a treat for me that you're here and that I'm. Uh, this is actually happening. Um, and I actually, I looked up a little bit about Lehigh and I noticed that the model seems very germane to you. It's it's uh, man, the servants and interpreter of nature. Ah, okay. Did you know, know that that was the school the motto? I did not. <laughs> yeah, I've been here in 30 years and I didn't know. <laughs> that's, oh, a pretty, well. that's a pretty deep motto for a school. But um, <laughs> so I, I, I look at you that way, you know, as an interpreter of nature and um, and it, just in considering, you know, I just I just read your bio and um, I went on Wikipedia just to sort of cross check your bio against uh, what it had to say. And it had a slightly different bio for you, uh, which I'd like to just read you quickly. Mm. It says Michael J. Behe is an American biochemist, author and adv advocate of the pseudoscientific principle of intelligence design. So <laughs> what I'd like to start by asking you is. Why do they say that? What, what is pseudoscience? And why isn't it just science that you're doing? You are a ten, you know, professor at a major university. Uh, what's the difference between those two things? Well, uh, a, uh, I think a, a philosopher of science, I forget his name, uh, said that the word pseudoscience is mostly used to dismiss people that you don't want to converse with. And as I'm, <laughs> I'm sure many of your listeners know, uh, this topic of evolution and intelligent design is, is very controversial. And it turns out that the folks on Wikipedia seem to have one view of the, of the topic, and, and they're not going to let a reader decide for himself whether they think this has any merit or, or not, but hey, I, we, we're used to it by now, and so we just soldier on. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, you have uh, several books that I could recommend. Um, the most recent is called Darwin Devolves, Dev mm -hmm. um, and it, oh, that that's a picture from the book, but. Um, you mentioned in there uh, a number of different kinds of science, and you draw a distinction uh, at one point between physics and biology, and you describing, as I remember, physics as being simpler um, and, and therefore more comprehensible, um, and biology as being uh, having multi layers and a lot more complexity, and so on and so forth. Um, could you just talk for a minute about? the different kinds of science um, and how biochemistry is different in terms of its complexity? Sure. Um, sciences are built on each other. So, of course, the universe uh, is comprised of a lot of things. And you can ask, well, what are the most fundamental things in the universe? And that's pretty much the domain of physics, you know, electrons and protons and, and so on. Uh, but it turns out to be 
you know, difficult to study electrons and, and protons. So, but uh, physicists do a, a, a pretty good job of it and they learn a, uh, a lot of about their behavior. But if you just have one particle or a couple particles that you can follow, then you can study it in isolation. The big problem that science still, you know, can't get around and will never get around is that when you have many particles, it gets too complex for us to, uh, to have a complete description of it. And as you move up the scale of science from just particles to particles that combine into, say, molecules to get to, and that's the domain, of course, of chemistry, then things get a lot more complicated. And there's a number of chemical phenomena that aren't easily derived just from physics. And you have to study the chemical properties uh, themselves to to understand them. And when you move up another level, you know, life is composed of many chemicals, many chemicals in life. Uh, nonetheless, there are principles in which these chemicals act and the way they're put together and so on that is not found in just organic chemistry and, and physics and so on. So at each level and above biochemistry, you can go to cellular biology and then uh, physiology, and it can go to sociology then. <laughs> and each step you take up becomes more and more uh, difficult. And then would you say as a result of that, it, it's less clear um, and it's more difficult to come to particular conclusions about it? You know, for, I think you mentioned also food science, for instance, uh, which yes. seems like it's mm -hmm. constantly being revised, you know, um, certainly in my lifetime, uh, I remember salt and fat being horrible things. Um, and that seems to have uh, been revised. Um, I think that the, it's a great example, but the you know climatology, um, uh, forensics of all of all sorts, paleontology doesn't it? It just seems like certain types of science are much less definitive than others. Is that fair to say? Sure. Yeah, it is. And and it turns out that once you get complex components that are interacting and bouncing off each other, it becomes literally impossible to uh, follow them for a long term. And this was discovered, you know, kind of accidentally back in the early 60s uh, when an idea called chaos theory was proposed. And it was discovered in the context of weather forecasting. And that uh, uh, a man um, showed that uh, a weatherman showed that if if you have a number of different factors to consider, then uh, if it depends sharply on how the factors interact, then you if if you don't get all the factors just right, you won't be able to uh, predict the future. And everybody knows that you know <laughs> weather forecasting beyond a few days is is a is impossible pretty much. And it turns out the same thing is for same thing holds for other complex systems. You mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, 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 diets and recommendations for what's healthy to eat. And as we know, they've changed over the years, and what was bad for you to eat uh, is now you know good, and vice versa. And yet, we can study people. We can have them answer surveys. We can take their blood and, and uh, do tests on it and so on. And people still can't determine what is even healthy to eat. And yet biologists, evolutionary biologists, give the public the impression that they've got it all figured out, even though they can't measure extinct animals and uh, evolution happened over a very, very long time. And I try to make the point in the book that essentially that's just bluster. They, they can't, they can't uh, know what drove changes in uh, the living world. Okay. So your book focuses on several fascinating 
examples of this type of complexity that you're describing. And um, I just want to read you a quote that, that you wrote, um, which is, modern biology shows us that we are, we are the nursery tale X-Men, our bodies endowed with fantastic powers we never suspected. We are the fairy tale Borg of Star Trek, ourselves run by futuristic nanotechnology far superior to theirs. Real life is more marvelous than nursery tales and real biology more amazing than science fiction. Which So mm. I love that quote. And I wonder if you might be willing to take us through a couple mm. of examples of what you mean with, with your PowerPoint. Sure. Uh, let me just say that uh, to kind of set it up. Back in the 19th century, when Darwin was living and writing, uh, the cell was thought to be a, a little glob of protoplasm, a, a simple jelly, not very complex at all. And so Darwin was trying to explain, well, how you get from something simple to something more complex. And the story of modern biology is that we have discovered that the cell is run by machines, literally molecular machines that uh, operate the cell. They're you know, machines which help copy DNA, machines which help in locomotion, machines which make the chemicals and degrade the chemicals that uh, are necessary for metabolism. And uh, let's, <laughs> this is not a molecular machine, but if we see the first slide here, <sighs> This is part of the leg of a little bug called a plant hopper, which is really pretty common. And plant hoppers can jump further than any other bug. And scientists didn't know how for the longest time. And uh, about five years ago, scientists in England, using a new microscopic technique, came up with this picture. It turns out these things are gears, the gears from the two different legs at the top of the legs, and they interdigitate. And what this does is that if one leg starts to move, it forces the other leg to start moving too. And it turns out that nerve impulses are uh, too slow to coordinate the legs uh, essentially moving at the same time. So uh, this system relies on these gears. And when this was first uh, first uh, talked about and got on the internet, there were all these heavy theological <laughs> discussions about this bug for a couple of weeks. <laughs> and and then people went away and and you know they <laughs> they moved on to other things. But the thing is, you know, people saw purpose in this. It was an in-your-face mechanical gear. And I uh, pointed to that in Darwin Dissolves as simply one of the fantastic things that have been discovered in life. Now, here's a picture on the left of the bug itself. And, and you see the scale there that's just one millimeter long. It's a tiny, tiny thing. And and on the right are the tops of the two legs, and you see those little bumps on it. And they were first noticed in the 1950s, and people didn't know what they did or if they did anything. Maybe they were just kind of an accident there. Uh, and it wasn't until science progressed so that we had the instrumentation to observe them close up that these English uh, scientists uh, could determine that they were indeed real uh, mechanical gears. So I make the point that we see movies like the X-Men about all these powers that these folks have, and yet it turns out we got these incredible powers. We are a whole lot more sophisticated. Our, our, the, what it takes to operate us is you know light years beyond what anybody in Darwin's day uh, could even imagine. And is this example um, an outlier? Is um, are, are are we being are we being um, hyperbolic by describing it as as gears? Isn't that 
it may be more accurate just to say it's it's a strange uh, accident of nature, um, and that certainly you know given the eons of mm -hmm. evolution, yeah, stuff happens. I mean, it's it's odd, but it it is what it is. Well, uh, you know, people, some people do say that, but uh, I think showing the picture gets the point across. They, I mean, they are gears because that's what gears are. There are pieces of matter which can interdigitate and push against each other. So there's no sense in denying calling them gears uh, when they function as gears. And in the insect's life, it depends on them acting as gears in order to allow it to jump. So uh, I see no good reason uh, that we shouldn't call these gears other than to kind of uh, try to shy away from some difficult uh, philosophical questions. It, meaning uh, this is an example of what's called teleology. You, you would say that this is an example yes. of purpose. Purpose, yes. We, it turns out we discern purpose. We, we folks have minds and you can ask, how do we know something was done on purpose? Or how do we know a, a somebody with another person with a mind has acted? And I've written in the books that the way we determine that something is designed or that a mind has done something is by the purposeful arrangement of parts. That is, you know, minds and only minds can have purposes. Nothing else can have a purpose. And to the extent that it can manipulate objects, then a mind can arrange things to help fulfill the purposes. And so since we have minds ourselves, we can uh, perceive the purpose in an arrangement of physical matter or, or other stuff in our universe. So when you see matter arranged such as in those gears of the plant hopper, you can immediately see the, the purpose behind it. And so that's, that's how we, uh, that's how we, detect design. That's how we know that there was an intelligence behind this. Okay. Um, let's pivot one second to um, your concept of irreducible complexity. Um, we do have a slide for that as well, I believe. And I wonder if you would take us through that concept and what it means. Sure. Well, the, uh, the, uh, reason for this concept and this little mousetrap here goes back to Darwin because Darwin's theory of evolution, he said, uh, it had to work by quote, numerous successive slight modifications. So his idea of evolution was that there was a, a, a bunch of organisms and one came along with a little variation and, and luckily that helped the organism. And so it prospered. And maybe another one came along in one of the progeny of the first, and that helped a little more. And they built on each other. And one making the last one better and better and better. And he also, he said that if there existed an organ, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, then his theory would, would break down. Well, if you ask yourself what sort of system can't be made by these many tiny steps and with it functioning the whole way, well, it's simply a system that needs a number of parts in order to work. And uh, to illustrate it, I, I used a, an example of a mouse trap. Uh, even a, an ordinary little mouse trap has a number of parts that interact with each other in order to do its function. Uh, you see the mousetrap in the picture has a big wooden base and it's got a spring and it's got other metal parts like what's called the hammer and the holding bar and spring and catch and staples and all sorts of other things too. And it turns out if you don't have one of these parts, it doesn't work. 
And it's real hard, surprisingly difficult, to try to uh, suggest a pathway by which something like uh, the mousetrap can be made by numerous successive slight modifications. It seems to have to be there all together at once for it uh, to work. So this is a big problem for Darwin's theory, irreducibly complex systems. And as I go on to uh, show in the book, the cell is filled with such systems. That is, systems that need a number of parts in order to do their function. And so on the face of it, you know, Darwin's own challenge uh, is met that we found lots of systems that resist explanation by this gradual means that that he envisioned. So would, it, would you say um, an example like pregnancy seems like something that would have to work um, in, in a correct sequence uh, with with thousands and thousands of different things happening correctly mm -hmm. the first time where you don't have life? Would that be an example of uh, this kind of complexity? Well, um, I, I wouldn't use that example, although I certainly agree that it has many, many uh, features that would have to be correct. But me, I'm a biochemist, and biochemists deal with molecules and stuff, not, not whole organs or, or, or systems. And I like to focus on molecules because in whole organs or whole organisms, they are so complex that you can't know all of the parts that are necessary. And when there's ignorance or when there's clouds of, of, uh, of stuff that you don't know about, then it's easier for Darwinists to come in and tell what are called just so stories. Well, suppose yeah. this happened and suppose that happened. But when you focus on something as simple as a mousetrap with all its parts right there, and you find out that Darwinists can't even explain that in a plausible fashion, and you go on to look at some of the molecular machinery that fills the cell, then you can really kind of pin it down, pin down the, the problem for this unintelligent, undirected uh, theory of evolution. So what would you say is the more reasonable concept? Um, intelligent design or Darwinism? Uh, we hear often that, you know, uh, that the um, spiritual ideas, theological ideas are, are without reason. <clears throat> and, you know, there's a hope that the religious types will sort of make it into the 21st century and and leave the superstition behind. But it sounds to uh -huh. me that I, I mean, I'll, I'll let you say it in your own words. But which theory is more reasonable? Well, um, guess what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I I think intelligent design is far more reasonable. Yeah, well, it, back in the day, back in Darwin's time. You know, he had an idea. He had a shot at it. You know, there were some, there were a lot of problems even back then. But, you know, this idea of gradual changes was new because back in the 19th century, people were just finding new organisms in nature. And so they were thinking about a lot of these things for the first time. But now that we've discovered that, in rather than getting simpler, as you go down in the levels of life, it gets much and much more complicated than his, his theory is, I think, been falsified by the discoveries of modern science. I, I think it was fa probably falsified back when Watson and Crick discovered, <laughs> discovered DNA and the genetic code and so on, but uh, it's, it's only gotten worse in the intervening years. So, uh, Everybody agrees, even Richard Dawkins, who is a uh, Darwinian uh, a, a apologist in, the, in our times, everyone agrees that life looks 
looks uh, profoundly designed. It's really elegant. It's wonderful. And Dawkins says it looks like what an engineer would have put together. Uh, and the explanation of Darwin was meant to try to explain away the compelling uh, appearance of design, the purposeful arrangement of parts. And since Darwinism has failed to do that, and uh, we have lots of reasons to think it failed, then it's reasonable based on our biological knowledge of the things Darwin knew and a lot of stuff he didn't know, that this could not occur by the unintelligent, random, gradual changes that, that he proposed. Okay. So if the Darwinian model is false, as you're claiming, do you believe that there was a transition from species to species? Um, it, is it the case? It certainly seems like it. Um, when you look at the fossil record, not that I've studied in depth, but you know, uh, when you look at it, there's definitely a, a development from less complex to more complex. Mm -hmm. um, and from what I understand, the genetic codes of differing creatures um, are quite similar. Um, do you believe that it happened somehow that, that one creature morphed into another? Well, uh... I am willing to say that uh, that may have happened for purposes of the argument, uh, because to me, the idea of common descent, that uh, organisms descended from each other, is actually a trivial claim, although it kind of shocks you at, at, first, uh, at first hearing it. It's actually trivial, because... The claim of common descent just says that, well, we've got a, an organism here and a different kind of organism over there. And what do you know? They have a very similar way of doing something or trait. And so we can explain that, or this might be expected to happen, if they both descended from a, an ancestor in the misty past that originally had it and they inherited it going down this branch and another branch of of life but it only explains or only tries to explain uh, or I should say that it doesn't explain where the ancestor came from it doesn't explain how it had the uh, feature in the first place and it doesn't explain how these branches came to differ from each other. To my thinking, you know, again, common descent has little philosophical, uh, theological, uh, even scientific impact. The big claim of Darwin is that this could have happened utterly randomly without any intelligent input whatsoever ever. And it's exactly that feature of his theory that has, in my humble opinion, uh, zero to negative amounts of uh, evidence for it. So I'm happy to say, well, maybe the unfolding of life was directed. And maybe there were simpler organisms in the, in the beginning because they were needed to develop the earth somehow or um, and then over time, they uh, uh, they uh, uh, became more complex, but they would have needed to be directed or somehow programmed to uh, acquire complicated features. Okay, so you're saying it's possible. Hmm. You, you don't discount it, but I mean, do you have a guess? Do you, does your gut tell you something yeah. different than that? Uh, no, actually, it does not. Uh, there are features, as you mentioned, that are very similar, and they'd be uh, they it might be explained if they descended and inherited these features. 
but there are some kinks in lining up different organisms too. And not everything fits hunky-dory with that idea. So uh, I, I hold it uh, lightly uh, and I, I don't care really. I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm different than a lot of people, even my colleagues that I hang out with that I don't put a lot of importance on common descent. Uh, it, to me, the whole game is uh, intelligence versus randomness. Right. Okay. And, and, and you do talk about that in the book. Um, um, and I, it, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating concept in general, the, the whole war between randomness and, and purpose and teleology is, is ancient. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And probably one of the most important questions that we could ask ourselves with huge import on, on how we live and the nature mm -hmm. of society and everything. Um, and that's a good segue, I think, into uh, a quote that I wanted to read you from a woman named Mary Midgley, um, who is a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a book called Evolution as Religion. And if you just give me it's a, a few sentences, but let me just read it because I think it's a very good quote. She says, I had been struck for some time by certain remarkable prophetic and metaphysical passages that appeared suddenly in scientific books about evolution, often in their last chapters. Through these passages, though these passages were detached from the official reasoning of the books, they seemed still to be presented as science. But they made startling suggestions about vast themes such as immortality, human destiny, and the meaning of life. These are difficult topics with which philosophical and religious thinkers have long wrestled. But the scientific writers did not usually refer to any earlier discussions. They simply and confidently laid down their own surprising views about them. Their pronouncements seemed to be seriously intended, but it was far from clear on what level they were meant to be taken. So in, as a complete layman, I have noticed myself that science seems to always end in philosophy. Mm. Um, and I'm not totally sure what the qualifications are for, the, for many scientists to make the leap in, into philosophy. But you say also in the book, quote, Darwinism's icy grip on modern intellectual life is based on shoddy philosophy, not science. Could you comment uh, for a moment on, on that about the concept of, of evolution becoming a religion almost? Yeah, uh, uh, from the beginning even, a, a lot of people who were not philosophically sophisticated saw Darwin's explanation as kind of a God substitute. And this is really uh, the idea of materialism that in fact, the universe explains itself, or uh, there's nothing in the universe except matter and energy, uh, has really gotten a grip on science and from science has radiated out to all academic uh, disciplines. And Midgley uh, is correct that if you read a lot of science, even if you read the official science journals, even official research papers, you will find lots of comments saying that Darwin freed humanity from superstitious beliefs and so on. Michael Roos, a philosopher of science at Florida State, uh, and he's, he's published a number of books on Darwinian biology, philosophy of Darwinian biology, says that yes, indeed, evolution uh, Darwinism is a religion for a lot of scientists. And he says he even knew people who said grace to natural selection. Uh, and I don't know if that's correct, but he, that's what he says. Uh, and it's clear that we're reaching for deep questions. And lots of people have their own uh, ideas that they're rooting for. Unfortunately, they've gotten kind of baked into science these days so that somehow it has become a dogma that you have to reject design or uh, discernment of, of a mind or anything in, in physical nature or in, in life. 
it's you're certainly allowed to say there's no sign of design. <laughs> but if you say, wait, wait a second, no, I do see signs of design, then uh, then you're uh, you're in trouble. Um, so that's uh, and it's widespread. It's not just uh, again scientists, but it's gotten into journalism and psychology and history and 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 so on. And uh, you're really are out of step in academia if you argue for the reality of purpose. Yeah, um, I understand. And uh, I think that that's something that us, the theological types, wrestle with. Um, and um, it's a major, major topic and certainly one worthy of uh, a lot of uh, th thought. Um, mm -hmm. But let me... Let me ask you as a religious person, because I know you are a religious person and, and uh, seemingly one of the few scientists these days who, who can make that claim, um, although I don't really know, but I, seemingly, um, do you feel that you have the same standard of proof and evidence for your religiosity as you do for your science? Uh, well, that's, or, does it, does it, or is it necessary and, or does it, would it bother you? You know, mm -hmm. and one other way I might phrase that is like, is religion falsifiable? Like, you know, is there something that anyone could say that would knock that off of the pedestal for you? Well, uh, it would take a, a lot. I've, I've, I was raised Christian, a Catholic and, uh, but I've also read lots of philosophical texts and so on, arguments about mind and about uh, logic and design and, and being and all sorts of uh, philosophical topics, and I find them very persuasive. And additionally, I and most people know that they have minds, and I have been confident forever that the mind points strongly to God, to something beyond nature. We are not just uh, physical systems knocked here and there by uh, physical forces. We can understand, we can comprehend, we can make decisions. Uh, and so if somebody showed that, you know, we, we uh, weren't intelligent, that we didn't have minds, that we couldn't make decisions, well, that would be a surprise. And uh, that might, you know, no, that might uh, give me pause. But since it's self-contradictory, <laughs> I don't see how, how that could happen. So, so um, just to follow it up, but a, a materialist could say to me or to you, um, listen, you know, uh, my science might be wrong. You know, but I'm willing to reevaluate it as soon as there's new evidence presented. Although, you know, as we know that that can be a slow process, but, mm -hmm. but in theory, a materialist and a science-focused person would say, "Okay, there's new evidence. I'm going to evaluate it. I'm going to I'm going to, re I'm going to reinterpret the, the data." Mm -hmm. But they would, I think, they would look at you and me and others and say, "I don't think you guys are leaving this thing, no matter what." You know, uh, that there's no piece of information that could be brought to, to bear, that no tenet of your faith is going to be rejected. And therefore, the attitude that you have as a scientist is not the same as the one you have as, as a religious person. Well, uh, I would disagree. And I would say uh, that I, I, in fact, myself used to think Darwin's theory was correct because... Uh, that's what I was taught in school. It's not because I had some sort of independent evidence. That's what my teachers said. And, you know, who was I to, to say that they were wrong? It was only later that because of reading scientific evidence that I became convinced that it's, it didn't have a chance of explaining the biochemical evidence in particular. Uh, additionally, uh, I would question whether the imagined imaginary uh, conversation partner was really willing to question uh, his beliefs given the evidence, since it's because of new evidence, it, since it's because of what science has discovered in the past 
hundred years or so of things that Darwin didn't know, that the cell contains information, that it's got machinery in it, that it is complex beyond Darwin's imagining, that the argument for design has become stronger. It was a lot more, it, a lot easier to believe in Darwinian evolution when we knew a whole lot less. But now uh, nobody has explanations for this. And yet I run into people such as you, uh, as you imagine that say that, well, I'm not going to throw up my hands and, and talk about intelligent design. I'm going to continue doing science. Well, why? <laughs> I mean, here's the evidence, you know. And it turns out in the history of science, there have been other episodes in which a discovery had uh, theological implications and scientists didn't like that. And uh, the one... Uh, the mo one of the more recent ones was the proposal for the Big Bang Theory in the 1930s and, and onwards, that scientists proposed that the universe started at a moment in time and, and, and this enormous uh, release of energy and matter and, and so on. And it struck many people that, hey, maybe this was the creation. Maybe, you know, what, what could, you know, start a universe into existence if it isn't something outside the universe. And many scientists hated that idea. And uh, as in 19, and I think it was 1989, exactly. Hey, <laughs> I like that quote. Yeah. <laughs> in, in 1989, the journal Nature, which is the leading science journal in the world, had an editorial and the title of the editorial was Down with the Big Bang, Down with the Big Bang, in which uh, they said that the Big Bang is a creationist idea. Well, you know, they don't like it because it seems to have theological overtones, but it is based completely on the data on the empirical data and ordinary logic. If you see something moving away from a center, then you figure that's kind of after an explosion. Uh, and if the if scientists in the 30s and 40s had ignored the Big Bang proposal because they didn't like where it was headed, then science would have made a lot less progress in the last you know 80 years or so. And I think the same is true of intelligent design. It might have uh, theological implications, but it comes about pretty straightforwardly from the data. Okay, great. I <clears throat> have a couple more questions, if you don't mind. Please. Um, <laughs> so I have one, one more quote for you, which comes from Jacques Monod. Um, a fellow biologist, a uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, who said the, to me uh, the following startling thing, which is, he said, it is perfectly true that science attacks values. If he accepts this message in its full significance, man must at last wake out of his millenary dream and discover his total solitude, his fundamental isolation. He must realize that, like a gypsy, he lives on the boundary of an alien world, a world that is deaf to his music and as indifferent to his hopes as it is to his sufferings or his crimes. Yes. I, I found that a very bleak um, uh, conclusion to draw um, about what science adds to humanity. Um, can I get your reaction to that? Um, and, and do you agree that science does this, or is it a certain kind of science that does this? Well, I, I think it's a certain kind of scientist who does this? The, the science is what it is. And um, it turns out that that thread of thought or that uh, that posture is is goes a lot further back than Francois Jacob. I remember reading a book by a guy named Bertrand Russell, who was a philosopher in the early part of the 20th century. And he essentially had this poetic line where he says, there's no no honor, no deed of glory that 
can survive the heat death of the of the universe and and from what i can see it's simply that um some people if they see that they can understand how something works like they can understand gravity or electrons or they can see how genes are regulated which is what uh mano and jacob uh won the nobel prize for then they think you know what's you know this is just mechanical stuff working you know and and therefore it doesn't have any purpose but they uh are not thinking it through, in, in my view. Uh, as biology progressed, I mean, Francois Jacob uh, was uh, studying the beginnings of the biological revolution, molecular biological revolution. He and his co workers studied how a gene, which you know, codes for a protein could be switched on and switched off at the right times, depending on the amount of a particular chemical, uh, a, a sugar, that a bacteria could ingest. So they're looking at control in this system. And control is, a, uh, is indicative of intelligence. It's, going on at the right time, going off at the wrong time. And since they worked, other scientists have shown that was the very, very tip of the iceberg. And that regulation and control and other systems uh, are just fill the cell. It's, it's like a computer operating system and, and even more. Uh, there's a quote, uh, Bill Gates, uh, said that you know DNA is like a computer program, but it's much more sophisticated than anything that he and his co-workers developed. So unfortunately, I think uh, somebody once said, you know, a little bit of science, it's uh, you 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 uh, become more skeptical of religion. You know a lot of science, then then you kind of see things differently. And unfortunately, I think these folks uh, were jumping to conclusions. Do you um, do you ever get frustrated? Uh, you know, you've been at this for a long time. Um, do you feel that the reception that you've received is fair? Do you ever get discouraged? Like, my gosh, you know, why I, it, this is so obvious to me, and I can't get people to see it. Like. Uh, how do, how do you feel about how it's all being played out out there? Yeah, I, I do get frustrated on occasion. Uh, when I, I first wrote Darwin's Black Box and it was published in the early or in the mid 90s, 1996, I thought, well, you know, you know probably a lot of, you know, people will see the error of their ways and, and agree with me, you know, because here it's <laughs> it's so straightforward. And that's when I found that people could wriggle around a whole lot and, and not really engage your argument and set up straw man and so on. And with subsequent books, uh, it's been the same old story uh, that uh, people, in my view, certainly scientists refuse to engage with the, with the real scientific data. They will dismiss it. They will say, well, in you know 20 years, we'll have a better understanding of that. And it's been about 25 years ago <laughs> since I've written Darwin's Black Box and, and things are only worse. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's really astounding to me, uh, especially since I'm in academia and, and the story has always been in academia. Well, people will take your idea seriously. They'll have to give serious responses, and that has not been my experience. But um, on balancing, I've had a lot of folks send me messages saying that it's they uh, their eyes have been opened, that they, they really uh, see now what their intuitions had been. And uh, so there are lots of success stories. Um, and uh, so 
that's certainly worth everything right there. Uh, if you can, if you can assist just uh, one or a few people, uh, that makes it worthwhile. But I think, I think things are actually moving, even in the scientific community. Uh, it's the, the uh, it's becoming more and more plain that something is amiss with the standard theory, and they're going to have to have to scramble. Okay. And last question, um, based on what you said, what, what do you see as the future for the Darwinian model? And, and do you think that intelligent design is going to supplant it? Or uh, what's going to happen in the next decade or so? Well, in, in the next decade, I think people will just kind of uh, try to come up with alternatives. Uh, and there's a whole lot of biologists who are trying to uh, trying to propose ideas that are outside of mainstream Darwinism because they see it does not explain much. And it's called the extended evolutionary synthesis, but they're still stuck in the rut of not recognizing the need for intelligence. And while they can explain a few things, you know, it's only a few things. And, and to me, those newish proposals are even less persuasive than Darwin's theory, which does explain some things anyway. Uh, the idea of intelligent design, I think it might make progress uh, under a disguise. Uh, I see, if you read the scientific literature, you find in biology, journals, more and more talk about engineering by evolution and engineering examples. And of course, engineering is an intelligent activity. And uh, so I think it'll, it'll uh, kind of try to sidle up to design without actually admitting the reality of design. But it, for the far term, I am utterly persuaded, I am quite serene that intelligent design will, will uh, uh, take over the field simply because that's what the data show. And you can't ignore the data for, forever. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic for the long term. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, it's been a real treat for me to be able to speak with you. I think that your uh, work is extremely important, as I mentioned, and I, I hope that you uh, go forth and uh, discover more and more, share with the public. And thank you so much for being here for tonight. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Okay, thank you. So um, join us next week and every week here uh, at Beyond Belief for more fascinating people like this and uh, fa fantastic, important ideas for con your consideration. We'll see you next time. Good night.